tersengguk-sengguk, mata terkebil-kebil, kelopak mata semakin tertutup atau kuyu. Lupa kejadian di waktu-waktu terakhir. Campsite operators given two years to comply with guidelines. Humanity content to be increased in information delivery. Well, good evening and salam Malaysia Madani. I'm Mohamed Amin Carlos and you are watching Malaysia Today. Now, the polling process for the Kamaman parliamentary by-election, which began at 8 a.m. today, concluded at 6 p.m. when all 49 polling centres were closed. Now, all ballot boxes from the polling centres involving 244 streams were taken to the vote-telling centre at Dewan Berlian Utama Kamaman Municipal Council before the official results are expected to be announced at 9 tonight. Now, according to the Election Commission, the EC, the voter turnout as of 4 p.m. stood at 60% of the 141,043 registered voters. Now, previously, the 387 policemen and six military personnel who were supposed to vote early on 28th November were instructed to fulfill their responsibility through postal ballots to focus on rescue works during the flood season. Meanwhile, on 28th November, the early voting process was still carried out at the Kijal police station involving just three voters who are spouses of military personnel. The by-election saw a straight fight between Barisan National or BN candidate, General Retired Tan Sri Raja Muhammad Afandi Raja Muhammad Noor and Trunganu Mantri Basar, Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Samsuri Mokhtar of PAS. The by-election was held following the decision of the Trunganu Election Court on 26 September to nullify the victory of PAS candidate Che Alias Hamid in the 15th general election. The Local Government Development Ministry, or KPKT, has given campsite operators a period of at least two years to comply with the campsite planning guidelines, or GPP, issued today. Its minister, Nga Ko Ming, said the guidelines which come into effect this month are intended to be a guide to the management and operation of campsites for the authorities, entrepreneurs and campsite operators, as well as the public. He said the guidelines were made not to punish anyone but to help existing and new campsite operators as there were feedback from those who do not know how to comply with the guidelines. Di mana dari kesepanduan ini telah kita mengenal pastikan pelbagai aspek. Pertama, daripada kesesuaian lokasi. Okay. Kedua, tempat tersebut yang memang boleh dimajukan. Di Ketiga, semua kemudahan awam yang wajib disediakan di tapak perkemahan. Seperti tandas, seperti mungkin ada surau, seperti ada tempat lighting, internet dan lain-lain. Kesemua ini akan memberikan garis panduan untuk PBT keluarkan lesen. Met after launching the GPP today, Nga added the preparation of the GPP is due to the landslide tragedy at a campsite in Batangkali, Slango, on 16th December last year, which claimed 31 lives. Commenting further, Nga said the six guiding principles of campsite planning cover safety, comfort, sustainability, social continuity, economic prosperity and legal compliance. Well, he said all six principles of the guidelines must be followed so that visitors to the licensed camping site will feel assuredly safe such as camping sites need to be at least 10 meters apart from waterfall areas. Malaysia has been re-elected to the International Maritime Organization or IMO Council under category C for the 2024-25 term, marking Malaysia's victory for the 10th consecutive time. The Transport Minister Anthony Logue said Malaysia was placed 10th out of the 20 seats after garnering 134 votes out of the 166 votes during the IMO 33rd Assembly in London, United Kingdom on Friday. Anthony Loke, who headed the Malaysian delegation to the Assembly, described the election as a recognition of the IMO and member countries of Malaysia's involvement, contribution and importance in the international maritime sector. Dan sudah tentu ini akan memberikan ruang kepada kita untuk terus memainkan peranan dalam dunia perkapalan di mana kita ada wakil kita yang akan duduk dalam majlis IMO yang merangka dasar-dasar dan juga peraturan-peraturan antarabangsa. 
The announcement for the Category C membership was made at the end of the Assembly, which comprises 170 countries present to vote for the 2024-25 term. The IMO Council members under Category C comprise 20 elected countries which have special interests in maritime transport or navigation and whose election to the Council will ensure the representation of all major geographic areas of the world. Also present at the Assembly were the Malaysian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Dr. Zakri Jafar and IMO Secretary General Kai Tak Lim. The emphasis on humanity themes in information delivery to the people will be increased. Communications and Digital Minister Fami Fadil said this would be discussed with the agencies under the KKD soon. Saya akan uh, bincang dengan uh, beberapa agensi yang mana untuk kalau kita sebelum ni kita ada sebut uh, contoh dana uh, kandungan yang yang mungkin berfokuskan kenegaraan. Tapi mungkin kita kena fokus kepada uh, aspek insan itu. Jadi saya nampak ada beberapa perkara yang selepas ni saya akan bawa ke agensi-agensi uh, dan kita terapkan. Ya. He also said that more writing workshops should be conducted to honor talents capable of producing creative content that upholds noble values and the like. Well, more than 100 services will be offered directly to visitors of the Madani government one-year anniversary program at the grounds of the Bukit Jalil National Stadium from the 8th to the 10th of December. Now, among the highlights are the event, or of the event are a helmet trade-in program and registration for the Chuti Chuti Chegu and Jom Exchange Al Quran initiatives. Kementerian Pengangkutan dia ada membuat uh, tawaran penukaran helmet secara oh. percuma. Ha, okay. Jadi um, apa uh, pengunjung mm -hmm. siapa saja boleh pergi bawa helmet dan tukar kepada helmet baru. Ah, banyak juga. Ha, banyak juga lah okay. RM3,000. Hmm. Jadi rider-rider uh, apa yang syarikat-syarikat rider yeah. penghantaran barang tu mm -hmm. dia boleh tukar helmet kepada mm -hmm. yang lebih selamat untuk mereka lah. Antara yang lain sikit ya. Nama dia ialah uh, program Jom Exchange Al-Quran oleh mm -hmm. Kementerian Dalam Negeri mm -hmm. di mana Al-Quran-Al-Quran yang lama mm -hmm. yang tak ada perakuan KDN yeah, kan, digalakkan mm -hmm. untuk dibawa ke uh, sesi tersebut yeah. akan ditukarkan dengan Al-Quran baru yang ada perakuan KDN. Wan Fadzlin Nadia was appearing as a guest on RTM's Selamat Pagi Malaysia program today. She also advised visitors to use public transport to the venue to avoid traffic congestion, adding that a free shuttle bus service will be available at Endah Parade, Pavilion Bukit Jalil, Maranti Technology Park and the Astro Visitor Parking Area as early as 7 a.m. Well, Johor ruler Sultan Ibrahim Ibn Almarhum Sultan Iskandar has been awarded an honorary PhD in Mechanical Engineering Technology by University Tun Hussein on Malaysia, UTHM. Now, the award is in recognition of the contribution and excellence of His Majesty's leadership to UTHM, the people of Johor and the country. Well, Tengku Makuta Johor, Tunku Ismail Ibni Sultan Ibrahim, who is also UTHM Chancellor, presented the honorary PhD during the university's 23rd convocation ceremony held at Dewan Sultan Ibrahim in UTHM Batu Pahat campus today. Also present at the ceremony was Permaisuri Johor, Raja Zarith Sofia Binti Almarhum Sultan Idris Shah. And in a statement posted on Sultan Ibrahim's official Facebook page, His Majesty was UTHM Chancellor between 2002 and 2022 before Tunku Ismail was appointed as the new Chancellor on 3rd December last year. On UTHM's 25th anniversary, Sultan Ibrahim made a major contribution to the university by supporting the development of innovative programs, including aeronautics, including donating the Lake Renegade LA-270 aircraft for the use of the program. Business segment, Human Resources Ministry to lead key implementations of progressive wage policy.
Well, young Libertad Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riyazuddin Al Musawa Billah Shah witnessed the exchange of documents on renewable energy investments in Malaysia at a ceremony held in Dubai. In an Instagram post today, Istana Negara informed that the exchange of documents involved Malaysian companies and the Pahang government with Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company PJSC or Masdar, a renewable energy company based in Abu Dhabi. Now, the Malaysian companies involved include Tanaga National Berhad, Sita Global. Berhad, Malakoff Berhad, Sai Park Resources Berhad, the Pahang State Secretary's Office, and Tadao Energy Sundarian Berhad. Well, it follows the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU between the Malaysian Investment Development Authority, Maida, and Masdar, which was witnessed by Prime Minister Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim during his visit to the UAE on October. The document exchange ceremony took place after the opening ceremony of the Malaysian Pavilion by His Majesty at Expo City, Dubai, yesterday. Now, the event was also attended by Foreign Minister Dr. Sri Dr. Zamri Abdul Qadir, Investment, Trade and Industry Minister Tegu Dr. Sri Zafrul Abdulaziz, Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change Minister Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad, and Malaysian Ambassador to the UAE Dr. Sri Ahmad Fadil Samsudin. Al Sultan Abdullah and Raja Pramaisuri Agong Tunku Aziza Amina Maimuna Skandaria are in Abu Dhabi for a special visit until 4th December. Bursa Malaysia is anticipated to experience some portfolio realignments and window dressing activities. Hence, the benchmark index is likely to trend higher next week as the market enters the month of December, according to an analyst. Now, Rakuten Trade Equity Research Vice President Tang or Tong Pak Ling said technically the benchmark index staged a rebound and broke out from the one-week bullish flag pattern with a long white candle yesterday. Now, he said the index has broken the 20-day exponential moving average, or EMA, of 1,453 today. Hence, it is expected to be an upward trend and momentum in the near future. Notably, Tong said the next resistance levels are identified at 1,465 and the psychological mark of 1,500. Now, if the FBM KLCI surpassed the 1,465 resistance line, Rakuten Trade foresees additional upward potential. Now, as such, the brokerage firm anticipates the index to trend within the 1,445 to 1,465 range for next week, with immediate support at 1,445 followed by 1,430. Bursa Malaysia ended the week with a firmer turnover of 17.66 billion units worth 13.94 billion ringgit versus 17.06 billion units valued at 10.28 billion ringgit in the preceding week. Well, committed to the progressive wage policy, the Human Resources Ministry, KSM, will lead various key functions, including conducting joint negotiations with employers and labor unions. Now, in addition to providing guidelines for employers and workers, its minister, V. Siva Kumar, said monitoring assessment and development coordination would also be carried out. Now, for system development, KSM is involved in the registration selection and monitoring of companies. Regarding skills enhancement, KSM will undertake training verification, training quality inspection, supervision auditing and training coordination. KSM will also provide guidance on annual salary increases through the preparation of proposals for such increases. According to Siva Kumar, the collaboration between KSM and the Economy Ministry in implementing the progressive wage policy will improve the quality of life for low-income workers by providing better wages, ultimately making a significant contribution to Malaysia's economic development. Well, Malaysia has pledged its support to ensure the effective implementation of the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change, or AWGCC, action plan. The Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change Minister, Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad, stressed that Malaysia's commitment as the group's chair to foster collaboration, drive innovation and support effective implementation of collective climate change action plans within the ASEAN community. 
He pointed out there was a need for ASEAN countries to negotiate issues of common interest as one voice in global forums such as the 28th Conference of Parties or COP28 to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. Nick Nadzmi noted that developing a long-term mitigation strategy for ASEAN would be key to inform sectoral and cross-sectoral policy planning in line with the pathway towards the Paris Agreement goals. Malaysia is hence formulating a long-term low emission strategy, lt -LEDs, and nationally determined contribution roadmap, which will serve as a comprehensive guideline towards our achieving net zero emissions as early as 2050. Among our priorities is the drafting of a climate change bill, the establishment of a national adaptation fund, and the development of a carbon market mechanism. He said this during the ASEAN Leadership in Addressing Climate Change Forum at the Malaysia Pavilion on the sidelines of the COP28 in Dubai today. Well, National Broadcaster Radio Television Malaysia RTM took home the PRCA Malaysia Leadership Award 2022 at the Malaysia Public Relations Awards, or MPRA 2023, on Friday. Its Director General, Dato Suhaimi Sulaiman, said the award was for the broadcaster's significant contribution to the nation's media landscape and outstanding achievements since 1946. Dato Suhaimi attributed the win to the collective efforts of everyone in RTM from journalists, publishers and others. Semua uh, kejayaan itu adalah kejayaan producer, reporter, penerbit dan ketua-ketua unit dan sebagainya and almost everybody di RTM yang membuatkan kejayaan ini. Jadi apa yang kita buat penambahbaikan itu semua uh, didn't go unnoticed. Eh. Jadi konsultan-konsultan di PRC Malaysia melihat akan perubahan yang kita buat. Met at the event, he also emphasized the interconnectedness of journalism and public relations. In its 15th edition, the MPRA 2023 celebrated the remarkable efforts of organizations, public relations consultants and in-house practitioners across private and public sectors, universities and individuals. Organized by the Public Relations and Communications Association of Malaysia, that's PRCA Malaysia, the prestigious event recognized 57 winners across 30 categories. On the foreign front, global drought reaches unprecedented emergency level. Sounds of explosions and smoke filled the skies over Gaza today as Israel's military resumed combat operations against Hamas for a second day after a ceasefire ended. Now the warring sides blame the other for the truce collapse by rejecting terms to extend the daily release of hostages held by resistance in exchange for Palestinians held in Israeli jails. Well, Israel said its ground, air and naval forces struck more than 200 quote-unquote terror targets, unquote on that one, in Gaza and by Friday evening, health officials in the coastal strip said Israeli strikes had killed 184 people, wounded at least 589 others and hit more than 20 20 houses. Mediators said the Israeli bombardments was, or rather, were complicating attempts to again pause hostilities. The seven-day truce, which began on 24th November and was extended twice, had allowed for the exchange of dozens of hostages held in Gaza for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners and facilitated the entry of humanitarian aid into the shattered coastal strip. Well, a report published by the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, or UNCCD, showed droughts have become an unprecedented emergency on a global scale. The massive impacts of human-induced droughts are only starting to unfold. Now, it said the severe drought worldwide has claimed more lives, caused heavier economic loss, and affected more social sectors than any other disaster. Now, the report was released at the outset of COP28 climate talks ongoing in UAE's Dubai. Based on data reported by 101 country parties to the UNCCD, 1.84 billion people are drought-stricken, out of which 4.7% are exposed to severe or extreme drought, and 85% of people affected by droughts live in low- or middle-income countries.
Now, according to the report, 23 million people in the Horn of Africa were deemed food insecure due to drought by December 2022. 5% area of the United States was suffering from severe to extreme droughts. And the drought-affected area in Europe reached 630,000 square kilometers in 2022, almost four times the average drought area recorded between 2000 and 2022. Regarding its impact on agriculture and forests, 70% of cereal crops in the Mediterranean region were lost to droughts in 2016 to 2018. And South Africa has so far lost at least 33% of its grazing land due to droughts. Now, while between 2000 and 2022, 73,000 square kilometers of farmland in the European Union countries were affected by droughts. Well, U.S. President Joe Biden's administration today announced it would tighten curbs on methane emissions from the oil and gas industry, while a critical step towards meeting its commitments to reduce the powerful greenhouse gas. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, made the announcement during the COP28 climate talks in the UAE, where the host country, the United States, and China were sent to hold talks on methane and other non-carbon dioxide gases. Methane tends to leak into the atmosphere undetected from drill sites, gas pipelines and other oil and gas equipment. The new standards would phase in a requirement to eliminate routine flaring of natural gas produced by oil wells and require comprehensive monitoring of methane leaks from wells and compression stations. These standards will prevent an estimated 58 million tons of methane emissions by 2038 an equivalent of 1.5 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. That's nearly as much carbon dioxide as emitted by the entire power sector in 2021. For perspective, the rule will deliver net climate and ozone health benefits of around $98 billion by 2038 and save enough gas to heat 7.8 million homes this winter. The United States and the EU led a global methane pledge at COP26 in Glasgow. It now has 111 country participants who have vowed to reduce methane emissions by 30% below 2020 levels by 2030. Well, Myanmar pro-democracy fighters in a battered pickup truck drive past abandoned and bombed out houses in the eastern city of Loikau on their way to the front lines of the battle to capture their first state capital from the junta. Now, People's Defense Force groups PDF that sprung up across Myanmar to fight the military's 2021 coup are now determined to capture Loi Khao and deal a blow to the country's rulers. Now, PDF and allied ethnic minority groups have been battling the Myanmar army for weeks in and around Loi Khao, a city nestled in lush hills and home to around 50,000 people in eastern Kai state. Now, PDF fighters said thousands of residents have already fled air attacks, artillery bombardments and urban battles. Now, the junta is reeling from an offensive by three ethnic minority groups along the rugged northern border with China that has captured several towns and blocked vital trade routes. This offensive dubbed Operation 1027 after the date it was launched five weeks ago is the biggest challenge faced by Myanmar's army since it seized power. Seventy-two thousand ringgit in matching grant to drone race Asia to boost its popularity. More on that in our sports sector. Well, the Youth and Sports Ministry or KBS has allocated a matching grant with seventy-two thousand ringgit to the organizers of the world's first indoor vertical drone race called Drone Race Asia 2023 in Kuala Lumpur. Now, its minister, Hannah Yeo, said the grant not only aims to boost the popularity of the sports, but also to help the national team improve their world ranking. 
Hannah also felt that this kind of new sport would provide a meaningful avenue for the younger generation and divert them from futile pursuits. The 5,000 US dollars three-day tournament kicked off yesterday and involves eight teams, including Malaysia, the United States, Spain, Thailand, and Singapore. The event is co-organized by the DRA Drone Racing Club, which is registered under the Sports Development Act 1996 and the Magic Beans Alchemy Sindirian Burhad. Amir Amri Mohammed was today elected as the new Malaysian rugby president for the term 2023 to 2027, replacing Dato Shahrul Zaman Yahya, who did not stand for election. Amir, who is also the Trivano Rugby Association president, garnered 27 votes in the election held in conjunction with Malaysia Rugby's annual general meeting at Wisma OCM in Kuala Lumpur. He defeated Kuala Lumpur Rugby Association President Dato Sri Zainal Abedin Muhammad Rafiq, who had 11 votes. Amir will be assisted by former national player Muhammad Azmir Zainal Abedin, who won unopposed as deputy president. Samsul Erwin Muhammad Lajis of Putrajaya and Abdul Rashid Adli of Labuan Rugby Association President garnered 29 and 22 votes each to be elected as vice president in a four-cornered fight. And on to football, Al-Hilal beat Al-Nasser 3-0 in the Riyadh Derby to extend their Saudi Pro League lead to seven points over Cristiano Ronaldo's side. Midfielder Sergei Milinkovic Savic opened the scoring for the host with a 64th minute header before fellow Serbian Alexander Mitrovic netted a brace late on. Al Hilal's near perfect evening was soured a bit when defender Ali Al Bulahi received a straight red card three minutes into stoppage time for an unsportsmanlike goal celebration in front of the opposition fans. Al Hilal maintained their unbeaten start in the league with 13 wins and two draws and move up to 41 points, with Al Nasser second on 34, four ahead of Al Ahli. In motorsports, Logan Sargent completed the 2024 Formula One starting grid with a 22-year-old U.S. driver securing a second season alongside Alex Albon in an unchanged lineup at Williams. The American, who scored one point in his rookie season this year, had been the only remaining uncertainty with all other drivers confirmed. The decision to retain Sargent also meant there will be no driver change on the grid from the end of one season to the start of the next, a rarity in the history of Grand Prix racing. Former champions Williams finished the season seventh overall this year, moving up from tenth and last in the previous campaign. Sargent, despite being outqualified by experienced thigh Albon, achieved several milestones, including being the first U.S. driver in 30 years to score a point and first since 1987 to start a home Grand Prix in the top 10. In golf, Japan's Rikuya Hoshino fired a flawless 65 for his share of the lead with Min Woo Lee at the Australian Open, while South Africa's Ashley Buhai moved into prime position to defend her women's title. Now, six-time Japan Tour winner Hoshino hit four birdies and an eagle to reel in Australian overnight leader Lee in his bid for a maiden DP World Tour win. Lee began the day in Sydney with a three-stroke lead from Scotland's Connie Syme and American Patrick Rogers, but struggled with his putter to card a one under par 70, holding a pressure birdie at the last. Lee opened with a birdie and it looked like he might run away with the lead. But he found the water at the third to card a double bogey and another bogey at the 10th couple with Hoshino's eagle at the 14th, put them level at 12 under par for the tournament. A birdie for Hoshino at the 18th edged him in front before Lee responded. England's Alex Fitzpatrick, the younger brother of last year's U.S. Open champion Matt Fitzpatrick, surged into contention with a 66 to be one behind them alongside Rogers. And with that, we reach the end of tonight's bulletin. Now, top story, campsite operators given two years to comply with guidelines. Do you join us tomorrow afternoon on TV2 for your daily world news. I'm Mohamed Amin Carlos. And from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Good night.